Today we're going to do a fairly chill grab bag psych. So last week I asked you all to email me um, something you'd want to know more about in psychology that maybe we haven't talked about or won't talk about in the class just because we just don't have the time and, and um, I don't teach the class in a traditional topic by week sort of um, in, a, in, a, in that sort of manner. Uh, so this t today, this is a um, set of material that I went and researched or I had already in my back pocket, just based on the fact that I, I teach a lot of classes at Eureka. So I was able to, you know, bring some stuff together. Um, I have a couple of um, uh, activities uh, based on one of the questions. So uh, throw a little office in there, which will probably copyright flag this video when it goes up on YouTube, but whatever. Um, it's on freaking YouTube. So it's like, guys, seriously, do you really need to copyright flag it? Um, it doesn't affect you being able to watch it because the, the videos aren't banned in the United States. They're banned elsewhere. So if you go travel, then you're going to have some problems. But, um, yeah, so the answers, uh, the questions slash answers are not in any particular order. I'm just, um, I, I just kind of did what I thought was going to be, I don't know, easy to get us going. And then sort of the more involved ones or later, I actually don't remember what the, the order is. So, you know, we're going to learn together. We are going to learn together. Uh, okay. Oh yes, dreaming was first. That was the dreaming one. So I received a number of uh, a number of questions. So Madison, Radcliffe, uh, Ben Burnaby, and Christine all emailed me some sort of question about um, dreams. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn off uh, um, pretzel here because I don't want the background music. Thank you. Uh, so. <clears throat> We all, uh, so the three of them emailed me something about dreams, and generally speaking, the questions were, what do we dream, why do we dream, what do the dreams mean, um, and uh, I think Ben asked, uh, how can we, how can you remember dreams? So I'm going to go ahead on this slide, tell you, tell you all about, as much as I know about dreams, and um, with the caveat, with the caveat that we, we, the royal we, editorial we, uh, psychologists do not know a ton about dreams. Either the psychological experience of them or the um, uh, physical experience of them slash physiological experience of them. We have some idea on both those ends, but that's the asterisk that I put um, that I put in this set of material. Okay, so so why do we dream, or what do we dream? Sorry. Um, and you probably know this if you remember your dreams. You probably know what it is that you dream. Um, and it's mostly mundane stuff. It's mostly your daily life. You dream about your life. And the things that you do in it. And sometimes they're fantastical. Sometimes they are fantasy. Uh, both in... Um, both in sort of like the f fantasy, sci-fi fantasy kind of realm. But also fantasy in a, in a sexual sense as well. So sexual fantasies can be played out in dreams. Um, but most of the time it's just like, oh, what am I going to do tomorrow? Or what did I do the other day? Or... Um, I dreamed about uh, hanging out with my friends and then, you know, somebody was coming after me and then so we had to kill him and and uh, uh, it was it was sad and um, then I woke up. <laughs> uh, sometimes dreams are scary. Uh, fever dreams are sometimes uh, crazy. Uh, like just mind-blowing if you remember them they're just like ah what did it ha what happened um but most of the time we just dream about our our lives and it's boring it's so boring that we tend not to remember these boring dreams okay um 
who has ever dreamed about um, a test that they need to take um, or has um, dreamed about uh, a, a presentation that they they have to give or dreamed about um, hanging out with friends or dream about their job and doing things at their job. What have you dreamed about recently? Why don't you tell me what you dreamed about recently? And we can sort of, we can sort of converge on this idea. Go ahead and do that in chat. I dreamed a dream. While I sing, my best lame is, I dreamed a dream. And now that dream is gone. Dreamed about a bad experience and woke up paranoid. Yeah, that's that's generally going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's generally going to happen. Yeah. Uh, anxiety fuels dreams, too. So if you have anxiety... Uh, you killed your brother! Jeez, Tatavian! Some mundane preoccupations for you, my friend. Uh, you drowned. Okay, um, that could be an allegory to coronavirus, sure. Uh, got into a car. Man, you guys! <laughs> got into a car crash. Just don't go driving, Trevor. Just don't go driving. On a beach with friends. Thank you, Andrew. There we go. There we go. I killed my brother. My God. <laughs> Sometimes stream in black and white rather than color. That's actually really interesting, Meredith. Yeah. Um, Maddie has a recurring dream stuck behind glass and nobody can hear or talk to me. Yeah. Uh, or see, see you. Yeah. Um, that is, uh, that's an interesting one. Fear of being fear of being uh isolated or um you know that sort of stuff i'm just doing some armchair uh analysis right now <laughs> so uh yeah ashlyn um yeah that's ashlyn is most people uh whatever is on my mind that day thinking about a new season of a tv show that, that excited to watch yeah yeah See how boring that is? <laughs> and I say that in the most uh, endearing way possible. Uh, my dreams are fantastically boring. So boring that I don't even remember them. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a, a big dream rememberer. Um, I generally speaking only remember dreams that... Um, uh, that occur right before I wake up. Um, or at least become lucid about them. Madison, you almost have, almost always have nightmares. Oh my god, your friends turn into the killers. Oh no, do they start playing music for you? I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, that's a bummer. Always having nightmares. That's rough. It's rough. How uh, how late do you eat before you go to bed? I might have something to do with it. Protein dreams. If you eat protein right before you go to bed, you're going to have some weird-ass dreams. Um, it's, there's definitely a correlation with um, uh, tough protein. So don't eat, like, don't eat chicken right before you go to bed. Don't eat a piece of steak right before you go to bed. It's a bad idea. Um, Madison, it could also be that you are rem only remembering the nightmares because they activate um your sympathetic nervous system while you're sleeping which then makes you jump into that mode and you'll you start to to focus in on what that is um Nehemiah, did i just uh did i just 
with the with the meat thing. Stop stop eating meat right before bed. <laughs> or your or your protein shakes. Um popcorn at night with your sister. Well, I w- is that a recent thing, Madison, or is that like a is that like a, a a thing that has been going on for a long time? I mean, you could just be a person who remembers the nightmares because of that sympathetic nervous system. Um so you know, um, yeah, I mean, you can love chicken and steak, Tatavian, but as long as you eat them after, uh, or bef- well before, well before you go to bed, then you're fine. Um, allow your, your digestive system to take care of that, um, tough, tough protein. Um, uh, Ashlyn, I will uh, I will address your question when when we're done with dreams. Um, but actually, I'm gonna hold on. No, actually, this is better. Uh, so on Thursday, when we talk about consciousness and sleep, I'll, I'll address your question. So if I don't remember, please ask it again because um, because that one goes along with that one goes along with um, with sleep. I think more than dreams. Okay. It's, um, yeah, sleep paralysis. Yeah. Mhm. Um the shadowy figures. So if you have sleep paralysis, the shadowy figures. So stay tuned for 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 um for Thursday. Okay? Um all right. So why do we dream? Um Why do we dream? <laughs> you you like killing your brother Tavian? Oh man. All right. Let's just let let's let not, let him not see this stream. Um Send him an email with a video of this of the, that part of the clip. <clears throat> Yo, bro, I uh, killed you last night in my dream. Yeah. Uh, is he older or younger? That's that's what I want to know. So why do we dream? Um, this I don't know if this was necessarily a, a direct question. I don't remember from the three of them, but. I do, um, I do think it's useful, um, I do think it's useful to, uh, talk about why we dream, and this feeds into Thursday as well, so why, why does our brain need to be active at night while we're sleeping, which is an altered state of consciousness? Why do we need to do this? Well, one of the, uh, reasons is a way to satisfy um, our own wishes. Now, Freud, Sigmund Freud was the one who came up with this, okay? Sigmund Freud was the one who came up with this. Um, So whether or not this is generally true, oh, I see, Datavian, I see, I see now. It all becomes clear. Uh, Satisfy our own wishes, right? So that was his mode. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll briefly talk about psychoanalysis, um, at the end of the semester when we talk about psychopathology, psych disorders, um, because it's useful, even though it's not necessarily a, um, an idea that generally holds a lot of uh, empirical weight these days, um, but we might dream to, to do that. But I think the three... The three, uh, the three other ones, well, four other ones, I should say, the four other bullet points are best. Now, again, um, this was generally speaking to go with the myth that I just told you about, but the, the whole learning thing, um, yeah, Christine, so that's the, that's the, 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 the claim that I just sent you all this morning. Yeah, exactly. So learning in our sleep is generally not the case. Okay, you definitely, so if you are going to encode and store memories as a function of your dream, as a way to consolidate those, those new neural pathways, it's not learning because you already did that while you were awake. Okay, so that's not technically learning because it, it, your, your brain's just putting those connections together for you while you're in this altered state of consciousness where you don't need energy to do um, you know, you know, other things like digest your food or go running or um, you know solve problems or whatever you're sleeping. But your mind needs to stay active, and one of the ways that it does this is by making those connections, and those connections turn into uh, experiences, okay? And those experiences then are perceived as dreams, okay? 
So um, whether this is learning is still a... Uh, it, it's debatable. I will say it's debatable. Like I said um, earlier uh, in the stream that um, when you investigate this claim for Thursday, you'll probably find, you know, a, a, a hearty debate on whether or not people think that it's true. Um, we'll go in more into that uh, on Thursday, of course. Um, another explanation for why we dream is to make sense of all of this neural activity. Okay. So, oh, interesting. Interesting, Christine. Yeah. It's going to be a hearty debate. There's going to be people on both sides. So good good luck on that. Whatever whatever one you want to write about is is up to you. Is up to you. Uh, but it is certainly a myth from a psychological, empirical psychological or psychological science standpoint. Because there's no evidence to support it. Okay. Um, uh, so making sense of neural activity while sleeping. This is incredibly important so we are constantly perceiving the world and when we're asleep we're not actually aware of most things and so one of the ways that um we perceive our brain activity is by dreams um and it's disconnected it's disjointed it's just weird right there's there's you don't follow the laws of physics you don't you can do things in your dreams that you can't do in real life like fly or kill your brother, you know. Um, I mean, you could kill your brother in real life, but it's probably not a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> so we make sense of all of these random neural connections by perceiving it as a, as a connected narrative. Um, another one is, and this one specifically, this this last one is specifically for children. And that is cognitive development. So the reason we dream once we're adults is more along the lines of the middle three bullet points. Potentially the first bullet point. Again, no evidence to suggest that is the case. Um, and uh, so for children, cognitive development is pretty... So you're making new connections. New connections as children. And so it's very important that you are building those you are building those memories, you are building those connections, and so on and so forth. Oop, that's it. Um, and so uh, I, th I think Ben's question was specifically, how do we remember dreams? It's, it's kind of difficult um, if you're not used to it. You can be better with practice. Um, keeping a sleep journal right next to your bed is uh, is. Uh, incredibly important if you want to remember your dreams. So as soon as you wake up from a dream, you write down all of the details that you can remember. So you, you, whatever you wake up, whenever you wake up, if it's 2 a.m., if it's 4 a.m., if it's 10 a.m., you write it down if you are, were actively dreaming and you're like, hmm, I want to remember that. So you write it down. That's how you end up getting better. That's practicing the, um, that's practicing the motions of making uh, you more aware of the dreams that are occurring. It's not going to be, uh, I want to say, it's not going to be perfect by any means. You're probably going to make uh, mistakes. Um, lucid dreaming, you can lucid dream. Lucid dream is, is totally... Uh, totally a thing. You can be aware of your dreaming. Uh, I tend to be aware of my dreaming later in the morning. So, you know, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., that sort of thing. Uh, for me, I don't remember my dreams that I have in the middle of the night, but I tend to remember my dreams more. And I know that I'm dreaming, like maybe halfway through the narrative. Um, so lucid dreaming is definitely possible. Again, there are techniques and stuff that you can find on the web for how to improve your dreaming, um, how to improve your lucid dreaming, I should say. And for those of you who are not familiar with lucid dreaming, lucid dreaming is the awareness that you are dreaming and that you are in a dream world, okay, or, or a dream narrative inside your head. So um, you could do, it takes practice, but you can you can do this, and that way you can engage with your dreams uh, a little bit more 
than you would normally if it was just you you were not aware and you were just a player in your dreams okay um so the last thing i want to say about dreams is a dream that i had about seven years ago um because it's an amazing dream and i love sharing it and i think we could all use a little bit of um happiness in our lives right now and so you can get that vicarious happiness whenever i think of this dream okay so um i was in grad school i i, th I think it happened oh it's in my, it's in my memories so whenever um like a facebook memories or whatever happen uh it, it comes up but i don't i think it happened in march or april i'm not sure i don't remember if i just recently saw it or if it's going to come up soon but it's somewhere around here. About seven years ago. Um, so I was dreaming. I was obviously sleeping. <laughs> um, and I was in a car. I, uh, I was not driving. But I was in a car with several of my friends. My wife was in the, it was in the car. And then a few other friends were, were in the car with us. And um, I, it look, I, I think we were going on a, on a uh, um, road trip or something like that. Well, we found ourselves on this big, huge bridge that was going over a gigantic body of water, kind of like um, that bridge over in Europe that connects like Copenhagen to um, Sweden, to the mainland of Scandinavia. And it's like going off, a, going over a big, uh, big body of water. And so it's like big expanse of water. Don't actually know where the land started and where the land ended or the bridge ended on the other side of the body of water. But we were going over this bridge. Um, and like I said, I wasn't driving. And so I just, I, I look out to my left and, uh, I'm, I'm looking out to my left and I'm looking at this big expanse of water. Um, there's, um, it's a sunny day, the sun's shining. And just then, as I look to my left, a narwhal jumps super high out of the water on my left, super high out of the water. If you're not familiar with what a narwhal is, it is a sea unicorn. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a whale with a giant horn, which is its tooth, by the way. It's a tooth, giant horn sticking out. It looks like a um, looks like a giant unicorn, but it's a tooth. It's pretty cool. And so the the narwhal jumps out of the 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 water, and it turns to me, and it and it and it looks straight at me. And it just gives me this giant smile. And at the same time, a lovely rainbow appears behind it. Okay. So the narwhal's jumping out of the water, turns to me, giant smile. Human teeth, by the way. Human teeth. Super random, but human teeth. But, and then it jumps back into the water and the, 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 the rainbow is still there. And I got to tell you, I, like I said, I remember dreams immediately if I wake, if I wake up immediately. So I woke up immediately and I just felt so good. Like it was, it, it, it was, um, like it was comforting and, um, just very, you know, I felt very content and very happy. It's just like narwhals, random narwhal, human smile, smiling at me, um, and then disappearing. Didn't say anything, didn't say anything to anybody in the car. I woke up and I just felt really good. Just felt really good. So that's my dream. That's my dream that I tell all of my, all, all of my classes, uh, because it's an amazing dream. Yeah, definitely not you know, murdering siblings. Yeah, thanks. All right. Moving on, moving on. Um, Jack, uh, Jack Arnett asked about CTE. CTE stands for Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy. Um, I, have this, I have this video from you, which I think is, is quite gnarly. And, and uh, so he had, and then he asked um, about effects and prevention. So I, I want to share with you what happens when um, you hit your head. 
and and so so that's what I keep pointing over my wrong shoulder. So that's what this video is going to show you. And then after the video plays, we'll talk about some effects and we'll talk about um, prevention efforts um, for those of you who you know who like playing um, contact sports, right? And this is a video that's just showing you mild. The brain is the most complex part of the human body. This three pound organ is the seat of intelligence, database of memories, interpreter of the senses, and the yeah. director of all movement. Some basic background on the brain. There you go. Lying in its bony shell and washed by protective fluid, the brain is also the most fragile organ in the body with the same texture and consistency as gelatin. Mm-hmm. Mm, jello. Mm. Within the brain are over 100 billion neur extracellular space. In turn, many of the surrounding neurons begin to die over the next 24 to 48 hours, worsening the initial effects of the injury. Mild to moderate cases of diffuse axonal injury, or DAI, may result in symptoms such as brief loss of consciousness, if you've ever had a con concussion, memory, reduced problem solving ability, lower social inhibition, and problems with attention and perception. Severe cases of diffuse axonal injury may result in coma or a persistent vegetative state. In the United States, over one million cases of mild traumatic brain injuries, including diffuse axonal injury, are reported each year. <sighs> of this number, over 300,000 patients suffer long-term effects from the damage. Computed tomography, or CT, and magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, are tests that can be performed to check for mild traumatic brain injury. So um, let me know in chat usually show a normal who's reading. had a concussion before. Therefore, doctors must rely on patient history and a clinical exam to diagnose mild traumatic brain injury. So that's the end of the video. So who's had a concussion? Um, moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let me know who, who has also had more than one concussion. More than one concussion. And if you've had a concussion, uh, I'll say... If you've had a concussion um, more than once in like the span of two or three months. My, uh... <laughs> this is so weird. It's strange. All right, whatever. <clears throat> as long as my hand doesn't disappear. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so a lot of you have had... Um, a lot of you... I have not seen the um, Aaron Hernandez doc on Netflix, Ashlyn. Um, but I'm definitely aware of, of Aaron Her Hernandez's case. And um, sort of how those... Um, his his multiple head head injuries and essentially CTE um, impacted what was already um, you know personality traits and that sort of thing and uh, led to uh, his behavior and ultimately his uh, suicide. So yeah, um, so uh, CTE. So you take you take this idea of diffuse axonal injury or brain contusions, concussions, that sort of thing, um, and uh, you 
you multiply that by a decade or two decades, then you end up with issues like Aaron Hernandez, Junior Seau. Okay, I'm not, I know I'm talking about football players, but they're the ones that, generally speaking, are the vast majority of victims of CTE right now. Um, and uh, we're finding out a lot about them and it from football players. Um, and it took a while. If you have seen um, the uh, the doctor, uh, the doctor... It starts with an O. I can't remember his name. Will Smith played them in in the movie, um, where he um, uh, whistle blew on the NFL and the concussion protocol and everything. And he, over the last several years, you you've seen the NFL basically make strides to um, improve their image uh, on concussion testing and concussion protocol and making sure that that you know if you have a concussion, you can't can't keep playing, you can't play next week, um, you may be out for an additional week, you know, that that sort of thing. Um, and so you saw the effects. Memory, memory loss, um, that's a huge one, especially if you have CT, if you have decades of CTE. Excuse me. Um, and uh, you uh, are constantly hitting your head definitely hitting your head is a bad one right um and uh it's gonna and so that memory loss is i think on the level of dementia alzheimer's patients it's pretty bad it's pretty bad um the third thing is uh the personality changes so if you're hitting the front of your head and, you know, you saw in the demonstration those whiplash injuries, you know, coup, coup, anti-coup uh, uh, injuries, um, you are damaging the impulse control in the prefrontal cortex. You're damaging your impulse control. And so you lack control over some additional, um, over some additional, uh, emotional control and inhibition and that sort of thing. And you know, a lot can be explained in the case of Aaron Hernandez in that case. Um, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to CTE is prevention. Uh, here's the deal. As much as technology is moving forward now that, you know, the NFL is not like CTE, that's not a thing. Um, and researchers are investigating helmets and technology to best protect your helmet. Here's the thing. Physics isn't going to stop. If your head is moving at a specific velocity and it stops, your brain is going to keep moving at that velocity until it smacks into the inside of your skull. Regardless of how much cushion you've put around the skull, it's still going to hit it because it's suspended and it's gelatinous. It's suspended and it's gelatinous. It's going to keep moving. That's how physics works. That's how inertia works. And so prevention is basically, if we want to like just get rid of CTE as best we can, you know, even then there's no more boxing. There's no more fighting. There's no more football. There's no more contact football or tackle football, right? We can watch uh, two-hand touch or flag football. Okay, it'll be it'll be like the Pro Bowl every every game, right? We're, we're, there's no more soccer, or if there is soccer, you can't do headers anymore. Okay, and how boring would that be? I gotta use my feet all the time. Ugh. what kind of game is this called football? Uh. So there's none of that, okay? There's no touching in basketball. If you want to get, if you want to prevent CTE, then you cannot hit the head. You cannot have the head be moving and then suddenly not move. That's how you prevent CTE. Um, fat chance that's going to ever happen. 
Uh, and so the the helmet technology is going to be, you know, it's gonna reach a it's gonna reach an asymptote of prevention. Those are my two cents on that one. So if you want to prevent CTE, no more contact sports. No more contact anything. You can play netball. Netball down in Australia. It's a it's a non contact sport. You are not allowed to touch people in netball. So if you want basketball to turn into netball, well, no more CTE, but <laughs> no more basketball. Uh, netball. I think it used to be an uh, Olympic sport, actually. Some choose. Thanks for the question. I, if I have time at the end of the, um, if I have time at the end of the stream, uh, I'm, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer that. Okay. All right, uh, Leona asked, uh, is love at first sight a thing? I'm going to quickly go over that. Uh, it can be, maybe, um, but there are probably way more factors in the love at first sight idea than um, what TV and movie shows tend to tend to portray. I, I have a very cynical view of love at first sight, but not in the fact that it can or cannot happen in real life, but how it's portrayed in the media. I think for Love at First Sight that you see in the media, the idea here is um, it's narrative expediency. So if you want two people to get together, then we're going to um, speed up their love connection. And so, of course, Love at First Sight works for that. Uh, so, and then that gives people a false sense of, false sense of what love is, what attraction is, and all of that stuff, because that's what we consume, and then that's what we, we want our lives to be, because it's so amazing. You meet somebody, and you fall in love with them. Oh, you know? But honestly, that's, that's only part of the puzzle. It's only part of the puzzle. Um, because you can be infatuated at first sight, but is it love? So, um, as a preview for something that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks, uh, I thought I'd talk about physical attractiveness. So, love at first. So, if you're going to love somebody, you're probably going to need to be infatuated with them. Um, an infatuation is just a, a desire or a lusting uh, for that person, okay? Um, there are different kinds of love. We'll talk about that as well um, uh, in a few weeks. But most of, the, most of, 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 of love does start off with some infatuation, and, and, and attraction really does rely on whether or not we think somebody is physically attractive, okay? Um, so I give permission to people to be somewhat, um, I don't want to say shallow, but at least talking about physical attractiveness, because you could look at somebody and be like, I don't, I don't like them because I don't like the way they look. That's fine. As long as you don't, you know, make fun of them or tell them like you're ugly or something, then that's fine. But you cannot like, you cannot be physically attracted to somebody. Okay, um, and part of this, ha or all, most of this has to do with the evolutionary um, mandate of reproduction, okay, and what physical attraction means for reproduction, right? We want people who don't look sickly, because if they're sickly, they probably won't be able to produce off offspring, um, male or female, okay? Um, and so males and females look for whatever mate that they're looking for, you know, an attraction. And uh, we're like, okay, well, are they going to bear me offspring? That's really all I really want to know. Okay. And in our modern, so that's an evolutionary percent. In our modern society, it's completely different because you can be attracted to somebody um, and not actually want to produce kids with that person because you don't want kids or they don't want kids or you both don't want kids or, or whatever. 
um, you still going to think they're attractive, and it's based on these de- these deeply um, these deeply wired beliefs about needing to procreate. Okay, um, Maddie, yeah, it's it's possible to convince yourself uh, if you're in love with somebody, but uh, at some level, you'll probably know that you're lying to yourself, um, and you will be unhappy with it. Um, there are a lot of social stereotypes with this. Uh, there is a um, uh, a heuristic that um, people generally make with respect to the evolutionary perspective, and that is what is beautiful is good. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, of course. So what is beautiful is good is, is an individual difference to most of us, and yet it is a heuristic we all, we all like, right? So what is beautiful is good is kind of like a... a uh, a heuristic that we all tend to follow and it is linked to actual outcomes most of the time most of the time people who are in committed relationships who say that they are in love with the person their partner will come out and say yes i think this person is physically attractive okay but Committed relationships are, generally speaking, longer term. Is it love at first sight? They might report that. They might report that. But here, hindsight is twenty twenty, And so are they actually reporting that um, they fell in love the first time they saw their partner? Or are they just sort of viewing the past meeting through the goggles of their com- commitment now? Their love now. Okay. So it's, you, you, you honestly can't go back to that moment and be like, oh, yeah, it was love at first sight, of course. I'm in my time time machine, and, and that's what it was. Um, and so this you know, behavioral confirmation and that uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so that uh, so in a nutshell, I think love at first sight can be a thing. But first of all, you need to be physically attracted to that person, of course. Um, and then there are other factors that... Uh, move move along um you could find somebody physically attractive and and honestly just hate that person's friggin guts um because they're an awful human being right you could just be like wow you are such a toxic person how why are you so beautiful to me get out of my life i like looking at you but i don't like hearing you talk i don't like engaging with you (laughs) please Go to Maddie's dream and go inside her cone of silence. You like I'm in full circle there. Um. So, yeah. Is the love of first sight? Eh, maybe. Eh, maybe. Um. So Christine also wanted to know. Uh, also wanted to revisit eyewitness testimony just a little bit. Um. <laughs> so um, and she specifically in her email said like you know eyewitness testimony is still used because it's useful and i agree with that um and then sometimes it's bad because um, people get um, fingered by the wrong person as an eyewitness and then they're convicted because that's the only evidence that um is uh is available and so overall her question was you know how do we prevent this sometimes bad from happening and overall i think to avoid the bad, um, law enforcement needs to use as much physical evidence as possible. And this also does move into the, the broader criminal justice system, you know, involving the courts and um, due process and things like that, is to minimize eyewitness testimony and to maximize as much physical evidence as possible. We're getting better at what what we know about physical evidence, you know, blood, if you've had classes with Dr. Lally, he talks about this extensively. If you have, if you're a CJ major, you'll, and you're going to have more classes with Dr. Lally, he's going to, you know, tell you more about, you know, blood, fingerprints, um, um, shoe patterns, tire tracks, how long somebody has been dead based on their decomp. And, and all of these, all of, all of those are physical pieces of evidence. Science supports what it is that you are doing for each of those things, 
Okay, there's evidence to suggest we can form a timeline from decomp, from, um, if you've watched CSI, entomologists will say, forensic entomologists will be like, mm, what's the stage of the pupa of the, of the maggots, right? Um, that'll tell you how long the body has been decomposing, etc. right? So as much physical evidence as possible, and um, with the increasing ubiquity of video cameras that, you know, are connected to home um, home internet networks and you know we're getting a bunch of cameras everywhere we're gonna be have more video evidence uh, for things right um, so as much physical evidence to minimize the need for eyewitness evidence because physical evidence is more uh, or I would say less refutable than eyewitness testimony because you're not relying on memory, you're relying on, on physical aspects of nature. Um, better police lineups. So I mentioned this at the end of our discussion on the, on the memory. Um, so the little demo that I had you do where some people, you know, fingered the wrong guy. Oh my goodness, I have an interloper here. So Ollie just came by, um, whether or not he comes in camera is another thing. Um, so better police lineup. So I showed you that thing, and and um, they were all lined up. You know the usual suspects, and then some of you um, said the wrong guy did the, the, you know, was setting the bomb on the rooftop. Uh, most of you accurately said, "Nah, he's not there. Don't worry about it." You know, none none of those guys are the none of those guys are the 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 criminal criminals, right? Um, Ollie, why don't you come in in and say hi, and then head back upstairs, please, instead of hiding. Please don't hit the green screen. Don't get under there. If you make it fall, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> uh, so there are a number of ways we can improve police lineups, that sort of thing. Um, come on in. Hi. Come on in. Hi, class. <laughs> come in a little bit more. Hi. No, I, I meant your body. Uh, nope, wrong way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Precious, that's a word. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it necessarily describes him. Cognitive interviews is another way to to uh, improve detection. Oh my gosh, go away. Um, you may have just gotten an alert about people with expertise for COVID-19. All right, buddy. Say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> um... Cognitive interviews. So if you want to increase um, the recollection of your eyewitnesses, then engaging in, in non-coercive or pressured interrogation interviews is in, incredibly important. And so that is getting the person to be in the moment, okay? To be in the moment and to remember what smells were, what sounds were, what um, what uh, um, they were wearing, what what people were what people were saying, um, what it is that they were doing, right? Instead of specifically asking them, "Hey, is this the guy or or gal, or um, is this the person who shot that individual that you saw?" like not specifically focusing on just the person and trying to get to the answer right away, but just letting the person um, return to that space and to explore all the aspects of the memory as rather than just the just the incident itself. And so, and and of course, the police should not be coercing eyewitnesses to um, name somebody as a suspect, um, and there should not be any pressure to do anything like I don't remember okay we'll, we'll send you on your way yeah that's probably gonna reduce the um, the case the case's timing 
and sometimes that's not desirable, but you can't force people to remember things. And lots of times people remember wrong things. Okay. All right. Uh, Trevor asked uh, what ha what makes a claim true or like how many um, people or bits of evidence would make something true. And so I just want to return very quickly to the scientific method and the, the cause I think the second to the last, um, if you if you go looking back at those slides, the second to the last um, tenet foundational component principle of the scientific method which is which is you just need to replicate over and 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 over again um so you move from theories to laws and so we have a law of gravity because we've spent we just not just humans in general we've spent hundreds of years testing all aspects of gravity on earth okay and that's just through repeated gravity experiments in physics that's just over and over and over and over and over and over and we are approaching some truth about gravity on earth now, gravity does not, the, the, the truth about gravity on Earth does not extend to other truths about gravity elsewhere in the universe, which is fine because then we can just stipulate different aspects of the, the theory or the law. Um, but in psychology, um, theories are only true if they are constantly being replicated and the effect is constantly being found as so described by previous research. Um, will we ever approach truth in anything? The answer is no. As I said in um, class, the first, like, first week of class, whatever, um, I said that we can't ever prove anything because proof is truth and truth is never attainable. Um, we will never attain truth from a scientific perspective. You may have beliefs about truth from some other perspective, whether it be religious or, or what have you, but we are not going to obtain truth from scientific. Um, we can achieve um, pretty good answers, pretty good predictions, but I don't think we're going to ever achieve truth. Now. Over the past decade or so, psychology has been going through some growing pains. We are a fairly young science. Um, science has been around for about 140 years or so. Compared to physics, biology, chemistry, this is a drop in the pan for science. Okay. Um, and over the past decade, we have found... Um, we have found issues i'll say with some of the effects that were identified over the past 140 years 130 if we discount this entire decade and so labs over the past decade maybe 15 years or so have been trying to replicate some classic effects in psychology and um many of them are coming up non-replicable which is not great for those things there are certain reasons for this. Um, many of them have to do with statistical methods that are were less sophisticated, and now they're more sophisticated, and so um, we're able to determine that you know maybe the older stats weren't so great. Uh, some other things um, have been shown to be fraudulent, so we're finding some cheats, some cheats and sneaks. Um, some other things have been found to be uh, through questionable research practices, QRPs as they're called. And um, so uh, this is kind of statistical. So my first reason, but kind of not statistical. So kind of fudging, not necessarily fraudulent, but fudging. Um, and so when you don't do the fudging, you don't get the effects. So, you know, there's that. Um, okay, so... We're, we're contending with this. Psychologists are contending with this right now. Uh, jury's still out on whether or not we are going to um, come out of this stronger or weaker. I don't know. We'll see. Scientific method doesn't care about your feelings, so we'll see. Okay. 
Um, so thanks for the question, Trevor. Now, uh, Whitney asked um, t for me to talk about um, Pavlov and Skinner as far as learning is concerned. So Pavlov, I'm just going to briefly talk about this. This is I go into way more detail in Learning Psych 285. Um, so here's Pavlov's dog. This is an, an artist's illustration of the dog setup that Pavlov was doing in Russia. Okay, in St. Petersburg, I believe. Um, so he was studying digestion, and he ended up serendipitously, a uh, happy accident, stumbling on the principles of classical conditioning. And so here's the dog set up. He was studying dog um, digestion, like I said, and specifically studying dog salivation. Okay, dog salivation. So he would prevent, present food to the dog, and there was this meter that was in the dog's mouth. It was actually surgically added to the dog's mouth um, that was connected to this contraption here, which then was connected to a um, electrical reader, which then put out a um, kind of like an e EKG or an ECG, sort of an electrical um, you know, voltage change because of the saliva um, activating an electrical circuit. And so this, this is what's called a cumulative recorder. And so it was just um, measuring how much saliva the dog was um, having, right? So, um, so we have the dog and it's salivating when food is presented to it. But what and and every time you presented the food with with um, the, every time you presented the dog with food, he rang a bell um, to signify the start of this recording. Well, whenever the dogs heard the bell, it was actually kind of like a tone, but it, it's been it, it it's been ingrandized into a bell. Whenever they heard the bell. They actually started salivating even when no food was present. And so this sort of response was elicited by this seemingly neutral stimulus, okay? And it becomes a conditioning stimulus or a conditioned stimulus. It was essentially not something that elicits this kind of reaction, salivating. Um, but once it's paired with something that does, the food, it elicits what... Um, what Pavlov turned into, a, a, or what he called a conditioned response. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of this. I do want to show you how the. Um, how, so this is the the makeup of it. So this is what happens. Don't worry about all of this stuff. Um, it's 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 definitely a higher level than um, what I wanted. To, what I want to go into, but I do want to show you how the office did this. Um, in oh wait oh no it's not the video i'm sorry i i messed that up okay good um so you can go find this on youtube and it's if you're familiar with the office you might be familiar with the scene already um it's when jim who is sitting across from dwight um starts connecting the windows xp shutdown sound with asking Dwight whether he not wants an Altoid. And he does this over and over and over again. And then interspersed with this, this is a, one of the, this is a, an early season cold open. So one of the cold open um, Dwight pranks. Jim, Jim Dwight pranks. Um, and interspersed with this, uh, Jim is explaining him in school learning about Pavlov and dogs and classical conditioning. And, um, Eventually, at the end of the prank, Jim shuts down his computer and Dwight just sticks out his hand like he's doing there, right? And he sighs and he goes, <sighs> and Jim goes, Dwight, what are you doing? Um, and, and Dwight goes, I don't, I don't know. I suddenly have a bad taste in my mouth. Ugh. And then it's a gym reaction shot, and then it goes into the dun -dun -dun, the 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 uh, intro and theme song. Um, it's a good one. It's a it's so I use this one to to show uh, the classical conditioning in the in a modern sense, really in a modern sense. Um, 
And then Whitney also asked about Skinner and operant conditioning. So Skinner is on the other side of learning, which is um, uh, learning through reinforcers and punishers. Um, and I wanted to share with you his, this is, so this is a, a, a fancy Skinner box. So I have one of these in my office. It works. So the shock grid down here works. Um, so if you ever want to get a little jolt of, if you want to ever get jazz yourself up, I'll go ahead and I'll plug it in. Uh, when we're able to go back to campus, I'll plug it in. You just stick your hand in there and, um, just jazzed, right? Ooh. Um, it, it's not a shock that can kill you. It's, um, it's low voltage. Um, low amps, uh, and uh, it's used to teach rats to press a lever when they're told to, when this uh, this light goes on, right? So the lever gives them food, the light turns um, on, and that's when they learn to press the lever. If they press the lever when the light's not on, then they get shocked. Good times, right? Uh, this is a pigeon box, so this is a Skinner box with pigeons in it. Um, but my... My favorite story, uh, Skinner loved pigeons. He actually preferred to do most of his uh, operant work with pigeons. And during World War II, he was asked to do something very important. He was asked to um, see whether or not pigeons could be used in homing missiles to destroy enemy ships. And it was called... Excuse you. And it was called... Um, this one, it was pro called, so this is the Pigeon Project, it was called, um, um, Orcon, Project Orcon, Organic Control is what Orcon stood for, and so this is a, um, small little thing. Now, on you, so this is a video that was, on YouTube, that was taken from somebody who is shining a camera at their TV screen, so just be aware of that, um, it's not the best quality, but it'll at least give you... Um, I'm, uh, it'll at least give you an idea of what this, um, this awesome yet never implemented idea was. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I hope there's subtitles on here. Yeah. Project Orkan. If somebody says to you, pigeon guy in a missile, the first thing you say is, what? It doesn't make any sense. Pigeons come home. Wrong place for a missile. But genius sees things differently. At the height of World War II, the Allies needed a guidance system that could target enemy warships. They found the answer in Harvard. And it was truly weird. Meet B.F. Skinner, Harvard professor and world authority on human and animal behavior. B.F. Skinner was one of the great minds in psychology. He actually pioneered positive and negative reinforcement, the basis of all animal training. Skinner uh, was probably the greatest psychologist of the 20th century. Some people think Sigmund Freud was, but he was really a neurologist. After years of studying animals in the lab, Skinner discovered a priceless military secret. If a smart weapon needs a smart pilot, then pigeons are the top guns. Pew pew! They have exceptional eyesight. Their brains can process visual information three times faster than a human's. And, most importantly, they can be trained. They're very smart. If someone tries to insult you and say you're, you're a bird brain, uh, my response would probably be, thank you. Skinner trains his pigeons using positive reinforcement. You can hear the guy who's filming this. I think it's so funny. I think you can hear his, like, fish tank. He trains them to complete incredibly complex tasks. He even teaches them to play ping pong. Yeah, this is, uh, that was real. Pigeon gets full military funding. And Skinner comes up with a groundbreaking missile design. The pigeon's head is squeezed into a sock and is placed in the missile where it can see the target ship through the windows. When the missile goes off course, 
The pigeon pecks at the target ship. The pecking controls the tail fins, bringing the missile back on target. He's not thinking, I want to get that target, right? But he is going to keep pecking uh, when the target stays on the center because that's when he was getting his food during training. A metal conductor was attached to the bird's beak to transmit its pecks to the guidance system. This footage shows Skinner's actual testing using projected images of enemy ships. The pigeons hit the target with near perfect accuracy. B.F. Skinner proved uh, no, he didn't. That a pigeon guided bomb would work. Even though it tested well, the U.S. High Command simply could not bring themselves to trust their bombs to bird brains. Luckily for the pigeons, they pulled the plug. The super psychologist was ultimately stymied by a simple lack of trust. Wouldn't you love to see it? Imagine taking love that guy's mustache. Pigeon. Guy's mustache is amazing. But probably a pain in the ass for eating. He's like, I have second dinner just in my mustache. So it was canceled in 1944. It was revived a, a, uh, a couple of years later, but it never got off the ground. Um, no pigeons died in this, so I wouldn't worry about the pigeons because um, no pigeons were harmed. Um, luckily, at the same time, computer scientists and engineers were working on how to actually use electronics in the missiles and ended up figuring out a much better strategy. It's quite cool that uh, Skinner was able to do this. Quite cool. Did not prove anything, though, but it was quite cool that um, he was able to do that. Uh, so, you know, shut up. Uh, so, uh, Ashton asks, is psychology a science? I'm gonna skip this video because we almost have to end here. Actually, it's 10.45 now. Um, and I'll, I'll play it on Thursday. We'll start with the rest of these slides on Thursday. Um, but I also want to share with you, um, so we're gonna skip that one. Uh, Detavian asks, do I believe in telepathy? And my answer is no. I can go into more detail if you want me to, but uh, the answer is definitely just no. There's no, um, there's no, uh, uh, there. Uh, don't be sad, Ash. Um, we'll get to it on Thursday. Uh, and then Meredith asked, and I think this is, yeah, this is the last side. Um, Meredith asked uh, about depression and anxiety in the time of COVID. Um, and so I went through and, and and I'll go into more detail about all of these and all of this in later this coming month, uh, later in April, when we go over depression and anxiety in general. But I wanted to put up some resources and I'll, I'll, I'll put this particular, these particular resources up on Brightspace, just in case you want to look them up. Um, some of them are just in general, how to deal with depression and anxiety in this time. Um, and, um, some of them is specifically for college students who are like you doing online distance learning and what that means and how that, um, Detavian, I don't think so. Um, and how that, uh, and how that, you know, how we can, you know, best put our best put forward. But I do want to say, I do want to end with the, um, uh, with the, with the final message that, you are okay, even if you aren't okay. There are people out there who love you, who trust you, who, who want you to be okay. And your feelings right now, whether it's depression, anxiety, grief, or something else, they're all valid. And um, you are allowed to feel those feelings. And you are okay to feel those feelings. It is normal. And... Um, it is worth it. We will we we will we will eventually come out of this and hopefully stronger. Um and it's just gonna take some time. It's just gonna take some time. It feels like it's gonna take forever. It's gonna take some time. 2020 is going to be the year of suckitude. Yep. 
this is going to go down in history as a really crappy year in all of our lives it you know in history um feel those feelings please engage in some um positive coping strategies uh, laughing uh playing exercising um problem solving uh but it's okay to feel those feelings and with that i am going to end the this stream so we'll talk more about this particular topic in a few weeks um we will start class with the other two ideas on um more specifically the psychology is a science i know ashton really wants to hear about that and um yeah i'll see you on thursday uh and we'll talk about that uh that claim bye